Hi guys, it's Mr. Y. <clears throat> Today we're going to continue our unit in genetics talking about transcription and translation and the basics of protein synthesis. So first we're going to talk about what proteins are. This will be kind of a review from the chemistry unit. What they are, what they do, what they're made of, um, including their function as enzymes. And then we're going to be talking about how proteins are made thanks to DNA through the processes of transcription here and translation and how DNA with the help of mRNA and tRNA and even an rRNA, these three guys here, uh, make this whole process work to produce proteins. So if you haven't watched already the video lectures on DNA and the, ver and the varieties of RNA, specifically mRNA and tRNA, please go back and watch those first. Otherwise, it's going to get really complex really fast here. Down below, there should also be a bunch of links Especially when it comes to transcription and translation, a lot of this stuff works better when you can see it in motion. Uh, I can't do that on the videos here, but I can link to many different animations and other YouTube videos that do show transcription and translation in motion. So please, please watch those. Watch all of them so you can see it in different formats, but it's the same process every time. So take a look at the links in the description just down below. All right. So a brief review of proteins. This is uh, harking back to our unit on chemistry back in the first semester. Remember, proteins are polymers. They are long chains of molecules strung together. So the whole thing here would be considered a protein. The individual links are the amino acids. So the individual molecules that make up the proteins are the amino acids. So those are the monomers. Mono meaning one, polymers meaning many. Here is an example of two amino acids, alanine and serine. And keep in mind the amino acids only differ because of this structure here, what we call the R group. They all have the amino group, they all have the carboxyl group here and here, but it's the R group that makes um, the amino acids slightly different. And when we link a whole bunch of amino acids together, then we get the polymer known as proteins. Here's another uh, diagram showing, again, the carboxyl group and the amine group that all amino acids have. And then again, the R group is what makes every amino acid different. So here, <clears throat> excuse me, you have one amino acid, two amino acids, three, and then four, and they all have different R groups linking them, uh, making them separate, but then they all link together to form eventually a protein. So yeah, there we go. So chains of amino acids, remember the amino acids are the monomers, mono meaning one, and well, together we call these proteins when they're in a very long chain. Sometimes they'll also call them polypeptides if they're in a rather shorter chain. So you may see that word pop up in some diagrams. Polypeptide is just a shorter chain of amino acids. So those are the amino acids. And then these bonds between the different amino acids are called peptide bonds. So the whole thing would be called a protein. So the unique thing about proteins, if you recall from the unit on chemistry, is that they don't stay in nice straight chains. They tend to fold in on themselves. They make these weird blobs that fold in based upon different chemical bonds between and across gaps, uh, disulfide bridges, if you recall. And these 3D shapes that they form when they fold in on themselves allow the proteins to do their specific jobs. And they have lots of possible jobs. And again, proteins are exceptionally long combinations of amino acids. So each one of these guys here is an amino acid. And again, they're magnifying this. You can see there's the R group, the amine group, and the carboxyl group. So this is a short, relatively speaking, chain, but the chain would be thousands of amino acids long usually. So because they fold in on themselves and make this unique 3D structure, it allows proteins to have very specific jobs, as I said before. So you'll recall from the chemistry unit that I said, the order of the amino acids is important. The order determines how these things will fold in on themselves and whether there's like a bridge or a chemical bridge here versus a chemical bridge here versus a chemical bridge here or even here. So the order determines the protein's shape, how it's gonna fold in. 
the sh shape of the protein will determine what job it can do and if it can do that job appropriately. So the order determines the shape, the shape determines the function, the job. So please remember this. Order determines shape, that is to say the order of the amino acids determines the protein shape, the shape determines its function. So in other words, if the amino acid order is messed up some way, if something goes wrong and the, the amino acids are not put in the right order, it potentially won't have the right shape in this three-dimensional structure. If it has the wrong sh shape, then its function may be inhibited, it may be um, um, compromised, it may not be able to do its job properly. Here's a much more accurate picture, again showing you the disulfide bridges that keep a 3D shape in um, an um, polypeptide protein, amino acid chain, basically. And again, if we just moved a few of these amino acids, specifically cysteine here, to different spots, we would have a different 3D shape. And again, the function of this guide may not work properly. And remember, proteins have lots of different functions. They are known as the hardest working molecule in the cell. So possible functions. Structural support, they help keep the cell's shape. They work in storage, like with the vacuole. They help transport stuff across the membrane. You can see here there's a protein channel. So keeping stuff in and out or helping stuff get across the membrane. Sensory reception, communication between cells. How cells actually know what to do next often comes from communication between cells. That can be done via protein signals. The muscle contract contractions of your um, entire body are based upon proteins doing the job. Your immune system, your white blood cells and your red blood cells, your white blood cells also known as T cells, are based upon pro proteins recognizing if a virus is present. Gene regulation, telling your DNA which genes to express and which genes to keep quiet. We'll talk more about that later. The building of cells, muscle cells, organ cells, brain cells, all done by proteins. Transporting oxygen in the, in the blood, hemoglobin. That's hemoglobin, that's a protein, hemoglobin. One of the most import, important proteins. And of course, the big one, enzymes. Remember, enzymes are catalysts. Catalysts speed up reactions. They don't change the reaction, they just make it happen faster. They're all about speed. Enzymes work by a physical lock and key system. That means they have to work with a specific, what we call, substrate. The substrate would be like the key, the enzyme would be kind of like the lock. And all it does is make this reaction happen faster than it would naturally. They do this by reducing what we call the activation energy, the energy needed to initially start the reaction. And after the reaction, the enzyme is released, and this is the important part, it is unchanged, so it can actually be recycled again and again and used up many times. The way you recognize an, an enzyme, and most proteins in this case, they always end in the same ASE letters. So if you hear anything that ends in an ASE, that's a sign as a protein. Usually it's a good sign, it's also an enzyme. So each of these animations shows something different about enzymes, so please make sure you go back and watch the whole thing because it's going to pause here in just a second. The top right shows you what happens if you put acid in an enzyme and how it changes the active shape. The top left here shows that the active site is specific to its specific enzyme, and the bottom left shows um, the substrate being broken apart and then released, and then showing you that the enzyme remains the same. It remains unchanged after the reaction has occurred. So remember the substrate here is very specific in its shape to match the active site of the enzyme. And the enzyme itself, remember, is just made of a bunch of amino acids linked together that have folded in on themselves in some unique shape. And that if we screw up the order of the amino acids, if something goes wrong and the order is screwed up, well then we screw up the shape and then just like in this top right picture, you would not see the reaction speed up. It wouldn't speed up the reaction and the reaction would probably take too long and if it's a necessary reaction for a cell to stay alive, the cell might die. All right, now we're gonna connect that whole bit on proteins now to DNA and where proteins come from. So first let's talk about genes. Genes are a specific segment of DNA that codes for proteins. This is what makes DNA so vital. DNA is basically the instructions for making 
proteins. So for example, in one strand of DNA, you can have multiple genes. Now this is just a basic diagram, but it shows you, you have gene one, which would code for protein number one, gene two, which codes for protein number two, and gene three, which can code for protein number three. So you can have multiple genes on the same strand of DNA. And the first step to getting your protein is a process called transcription. To transcribe something means to copy. So if you ever hear anything talking, anybody talking about um, the people who work in the courts who copy down what everybody's saying, those are called transcribers. So transcription is the copying of one side of DNA and creating a strand of messenger RNA, mRNA. And this is, this is happening inside the nucleus of most cells most of the time, except during um, mitosis or meiosis. When this process is completed, the mRNA that was transcribed from the specific gene will then travel outside the nucleus to be later translated. And this shows you here the basic process, which we'll go into detail in just a minute. You have DNA, it gets copied to form, this should be mRNA, and the mRNA gets then taken outside of the cell and later gets translated into a protein. So let's talk about how this transcription process works. Again, we're going to have two sets of DNA, but only one side is going to be really important for making the mRNA. So remember, every three base pairs of a DNA is called a codon. So this is one codon here, and then there's the next codon up to between here and here, and then so on and so forth, every three base pairs. So this is what we're going to call the transcribe side at the top. Now, I'm going to have you match it to the untranscribed side of DNA. So if you wish, pause the video, see if you can match it. This is DNA to DNA. Okay, you should have matched your A's and your T's and your C's and your G's because it's just DNA to DNA. Now, we're going to take the transcribed strand, this side, and we're going to make it match up to an RNA strand. This is going to be our mRNA strand. And we don't care about the untranscribed side. This is sometimes referred to as the junk strand. But for now, it's not that important to us. We only care about matching the transcribed. And keep in mind, the transcribed strand can be on the top or it can be on the bottom. I'm just putting it on the top now for the sake of simplicity. So we take the transcribed strand and we're going to base pair it here down to here. So again, do your base pairs, but this time you're going from DNA to RNA. And this is messenger RNA again. So you should have gotten this. Again, A now base pairs to U, going from DNA to RNA. T base pairs to A, G to C, G to C, A to U, etc, etc. And again, these are also called codons. But now this is an mRNA sequence, a messenger RNA sequence. Remember, messenger RNA is one long strand. And it's going to carry the message, the information of these instructions from the DNA out of the nucleus. Remember that from the last picture. So we have taken a specific gene, like gene 2 here, and we've transcribed it to an mRNA strand, which will then leave the nucleus after some polishing. And this polishing process is to remove specific portions of the mRNA. The parts we don't care, part, care about, excuse me, are called the introns. Introns. These are the junk RNA portions to be removed. The part we actually do care about are called the exons. These are the working RNA portions. These are spliced together, kind of like a film reel almost, to make the full mRNA chain that will then leave the nucleus. So you can see in this picture here, you have, this is DNA at the top here. Remember, we care about keeping the exons and we want to get rid of the introns. So the exons can be leaving the nucleus and the introns stay in the nucleus. So you can see this portion of the DNA is junk, from here to here is junk, from here to here is junk. And it all gets transcribed to the mRNA. So this is M. RNA down here in the green. And again, you've kept the exons and the introns, 
but we need to get rid of the introns. So there are some specific proteins that actually cut and splice these things out so that when it's all said and done, you have just the exons, exons one, two, and three spliced together, and that's what leaves the nucleus. It's just a finishing process. It happens all the time. <clears throat> Here's another picture of it. It's more in line with something you might see in your book. Again, we keep the exons and we get rid of the introns. So you can see the DNA at the top. This is the mRNA. And then after getting rid of all the introns, we have just the exons right here. And these will be taken outside the nucleus later on to be translated into a protein structure. So that's the basics of transcription. It's not all that complicated. There are a lot of good animations that I sh um, you should look at in the description that are specific to trans uh, transcription. Now that's from here to here for transcription. Now we're gonna go on to translation. How we get the mRNA to actually make a protein. How we take this message and actually make something out of it. Again, all these links you should see below. Look specifically so far at the transcription animations. We're going on to translation next. So after the mRNA leaves the nucleus, the process of translation takes the mRNA and uses that to create a chain of amino acids. Again, if you link all these amino acids in a long chain, you get proteins. The process, however, requires lots of different RNA. You not only have your mRNA, your messenger RNA, you're also going to be using tRNA and ribosomes. And just so you know, ribosomes are actually also made up of RNA. They're called rRNA. So you actually have three different types of RNA working in this process. Now, the next diagram, if you haven't got it in one of the last lectures, do get it this time. It is important, and make sure you get all the labels as well. Remember that cells use this process all the time to make proteins, and without proteins, no cell can survive. So this shows the process of translation. You have your tRNA. You have your mRNA, and you have your ribosomes, which is actually rRNA. And you have your title here for the whole process. And you can see the mRNA is being fed through the ribosomes, which has two subunits, a kind of a front one, a smaller one on the bottom, and then a larger one. And what it's doing is it's taking the tRNA and it's matching it to the mRNA based on the base pairs. It's matching every codon to an anticodon. And again, this is still A's and U's, C's and G's. And when they match up at the top of each of these tRNAs, you can see there's an amino acid. And the amino acid is specific to the anticodon. So a specific sequence here, here, here gives you a specific amino acid. And you can see there's this chain that's growing. What happens is as the next tRNA comes and latches on, thanks to the ribosome, this chain will jump to here, and then eventually to here, and it will grow one, two, three larger. So this chain continues to grow the entire process. And again, there's a lot of good animations that show this in motion, but this diagram is basically the entire translation process. And this is happening just outside the nucleus, usually in the rough endoplasmic reticulum where there's lots of ribosomes, but they can also happen in the cytoplasm where there's also free ribosomes. Now, this screen. This screen shows you a very good and important piece of information. This shows you the genetic code. And the genetic code is specific. It reads for the mRNA sequence. So for example, if your codon on your mRNA has the three letters, let's say G, A, C, you start from the center, you go G, A, C, and the protein that would be associated, thanks to the tRNAs, would be aspartic acid. You always start from the center and you work your way out. So if the code sequence was CCA, what would I get? Again, CCA on the mRNA sequence 
would eventually lead you to the amino acid called proline. And you'll notice there's redundancy. So for instance, if I had an error in the DNA and the code for the mRNA came out as CCU, well CCU still gives you proline. There's only 24 amino acids and there's 64 possible combinations for all this stuff. So there's some redundancies. That's what prevents mutations from being totally a massive issue. It's a protection system against mutations screwing up DNA too much and then screwing up the proteins. But some cases only have one option like A, U, G. That's the only way you get methionine. So learn to read this you will be responsible for knowing how to use the genetic code here and remember that it reads for mrna not the trna so it always reads for the mrna the sequence the codon not the anti-codon so let's try a quick run through suppose this is my transcribed side of dna it's just a simple codon agt i'm going to transcribe it to mrna first that gives me a to U, G to C, T to A. So UAC is my mRNA codon. And once that's shipped out of the nucleus after it's been edited and all the introns have been removed, that's the transcription process. We ship it outside the nucleus. And now the tRNA is going to base pair to it. That's going to be U to A, C to G, A to U. And which amino acid would you get from this reaction? Well, what's the sequence we're interested in? Remember, the genetic code reads for the mRNA sequence, not the tRNA. So the code we need is U here, C here, A. So if I did this right, the amino acid that I should be getting in this reaction should be serine. All right, serine. Again, if you read this the wrong way, if you read A, G, you look at that it actually comes out to the same thing that's just a natural redundancy sometimes that works sometimes that doesn't so you can't count on that you always have to read the mRNA sequence for the genetic code mRNA only sometimes you get lucky and they match up the same way either way sometimes it doesn't and that's the translation process so Let's try a slightly bigger version of that. And you can go back or you can look at the very bottom corner here if you can if you can see it. There's a picture in your book of the genetic code that you can look at at the same time. See if you can translate and transcribe, excuse me, transcribe and then translate this strand of DNA based upon its labels. So let's give it a try together. Notice I have this thing labeled as the untranscribed side meaning you have to find the transcribed side first. The untranscribed side is the junk. We want the other side. So we have to first go from DNA to DNA. T's to A's, A's uh, C's to G's. So this is the side we care about because this is the transcribed side. Again, it can be on the bottom or the top. It doesn't really matter. Just watch the labels. Now we need our mRNA sequence. So we're going to take this guy and make an mRNA sequence match to him, so A's to U's, C's to G's. So there's our codons, and this would be the transcription process. And now we're going to go on to the translation process happening outside the nucleus. U's to A's, C's to G's, again this is RNA to RNA, and because of this process, UAC, that's our first code, UAC for mRNA. If you actually look at it and you go UAC, you get tyrosine. If you did AUG, AUG would give you the wrong amino acid. That gives you methionine. So again, that's the tRNA anticodon sequence. If you continue with this process, which you should be able to do by now, you're going to go CUA, which will base pair with GAU. That's going to give you leucine. Again, you're using the CUA codon to read the genetic code. And the process would continue. This shows you which amino acids would eventually link together and the order to produce that protein that they're trying to make. So remember, the genetic code reads for mRNA, not the tRNA. Again, there's a lot of good videos that show this whole process in motion. Watch all of them, please. 
the more you see this, the more comfortable you'll get, the less uh, likelihood you'll have of, of, of uh, making little mistakes when I ask you to do these practice problems of transcribing and then translating, because you will be responsible for knowing how to do that. All right, guys, that'll wrap up transcription and translation. Make sure you ask questions in class if you're not sure about something, and I'll see you in the next lecture.